pleasure to have Dr. Jessica Nielsen here. She is an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota and has a joint appointmentship within the psychiatry department and the Institute for Health Informatics. And I had the great opportunity of getting to know Jessica while she was doing her postdoc at UC San Francisco. And while she was focused on using large data sets with human and animal data to look at how we can develop precision diagnosis and treatments for several different types of neurobiological disorders, including spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And she's carried this work forward in her research at uh, UM and has also now started to expand from work she started earlier at UCS, uh, UCSF, looking at um, a, a survey she conducted, looking at ayahuasca, people who self-reported on risk and benefits and how this information could potentially be used um, for people seeking help with these types of plant medicines for health conditions. She's done a lot of work too with looking at data and how this can uh, form different relationships between what we can look at from information collected from uh, many different data sources. So her journey has been really, really interesting and I can't wait to, to catch up and, and hear more about what her trial is gonna be looking at with psilocybin at UNM. So, and also a lot of her challenges and reflections of taking this journey through the research field. So thank you, Jessica, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Ali, for inviting me uh, to speak to your group. I'm really honored uh, to be able to work in this space. Uh, so I just have some slides I'm gonna pull up. Um, so let's see. All right, can you see that? Okay, good. All right, so, so today I'm gonna to just be talking about kind of my journey and how I got to where I am in being a psychedelic researcher um, at the University of Minnesota where I currently work. Um, so like Ali said, I'm an assistant professor in the psychiatry and behavioral sciences department at the University of Minnesota. And I'm also a core faculty at the Institute for Health Informatics. Okay. Go. All right, so just some disclosures, a um, little bit about me. I do have federal funding from the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, so there's sort of two sides to my lab. One side is doing these bioinformatics approaches, combining machine learning with large uh, data sets from biomedical research, um, particularly interested in post-traumatic stress. So I have a large grant uh, to do that work. Um, the other half of my lab is focusing on psychedelic research. And so I do have local funding set up from generous donations from the community uh, that I set up through the University of Minnesota Foundation, which is called the PATH Fund, it stands for Psychedelic Assisted Therapy. It's sort of like a broad um, discretionary fund for psychedelic research to get up and running at the University of Minnesota, because for the most part, uh, this type of work is pretty much been funded by donations from communities and um, generous uh, philanthropic donors uh, rather than federal funding. Uh, hopefully that'll change soon, but for now we really just have to rely on the generosity of others to implement this work. Um, I'm also the founder and associate director for the Psychedelic Society of Minnesota and co-founder of uh, Decriminalize Minneapolis, which is an effort to decriminalize drugs here in the city and hopefully statewide. And also just want to acknowledge my privilege as a white cis hetero woman. My pronouns are she, her, and also um, with that privilege, I am fortunate enough to be able to be sort of out as a psychonaut. Um, I also want to acknowledge the land of the University of Minnesota of Twin Cities. So this is in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, it's located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. And the university resides on Dakota land seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. So my journey into psychedelic research started, um, you know, obviously I, I had personal experience when I was in high school is where I actually first kind of became recreationally introduced to psychedelics. and. That didn't really start my academic journey per se. So in 2007, when I was in graduate school getting my PhD in neuroscience, I, I was a regular attendee of Burning Man and they would have these sort of academic um, lectures that were hosted by MAPS at one of the big camps. I think it was called Fractal Nation back then. Um, 
And I was amazed that there was actually an opportunity for people to do this kind of work with psychedelics at universities. So there was like Alicia Danforth talking from UCLA at the time. And I think Matt Johnson from um, Johns Hopkins was there giving a talk. And so it kind of gave me an idea of what I could potentially do once I got my PhD and potentially doing this professionally. Um, but it wasn't as straightforward as that because um, I was actually doing animal research with spinal cord injury and shoretic brain injury. And so it wasn't a natural synergy or logical flow to go from that kind of preclinical animal work to doing psychedelic research. Um, and actually I had a pretty hard time in graduate school. And by the time I finished, I wasn't really interested in doing science anymore. It was pretty traumatizing to have to kill animals. And so I spent four months just doing some soul searching after I finished my PhD. And during that time, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, somebody that had started a retreat center in Peru and um, was able to send me down to Peru to try ayahuasca. And I just serendipitously happened to also be in ceremony down there with a bunch of war veterans that were down there to treat uh, their post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, you know, I was able to have my own interesting experiences and transformations with ayahuasca, but what I really took away from that um, was the potential of ayahuasca to treat post-traumatic stress disorder um, and being able to witness firsthand the amazing transformation of some of these, uh, these guys that were down there um, who had pretty severe PTSD symptoms at the beginning of the week and just seeing them soften up and open up towards the end of the retreat was really inspiring. Um, so I came back to the United States and um, was kind of looking for an opportunity to do a postdoctoral fellowship somewhere. And I couldn't really get into any of the psychedelic research labs because I didn't have any experience in that field. I didn't have training in psychology or cognitive sciences or anything of that nature. So I actually wound up um, just joining a lab that uh, was continuing to do data science and um, more neurobiological models of trauma rather than looking at PTSD. But in doing so, like when I first came back, I was in San Francisco, as, as Ellie alluded to at UCSF, and I actually just reached out to Rick Doblin and said, you know, I am really interested in studying ayahuasca for PTSD. Do you know of anybody in the field that could help uh, get me connected to this? And uh, he responded right away, and I was very surprised that he did and felt really excited. And he said, actually, we just got contacted by National Geographic, and they're interested in um, following some people down to Peru to monitor people taking ayahuasca for PTSD. And we would love for you to be the spokesperson, spokesperson for this documentary, which I was like, well, that's a little interesting. Um, but it sounded like they were kind of just looking for, you know, someone with a doctor in front of their name to be in their um, documentary as kind of like the expert. Um, it was for this show called Drugs, Inc. Um, and so it was kind of an interesting way that they played that out as me being the expert, even though I really didn't have any knowledge or experience in that field, but I was happy to serve that role. Um, just to kind of get my my whistle wet in in that world and just you know helping to bridge a connection with Rick Doblin and the folks at the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And so these are just kind of a few of the the um, images that were taken. This is just kind of us sitting in front of the Maloka. Um, and then these are kind of just some things from another documentary. Um, and then this is kind of the screen capture from the National Geographic one. Um, so the next thing was really trying to figure out, okay, how can I build upon this? And so one of the things that somebody recommended to me was that, you know, maybe I could submit uh, like a position piece uh, in the MAPS annual bulletin. So I connected with somebody else that was also at UCSF, Julie Megler. She's a nurse, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner. And so together we co-wrote this kind of like um, argument for why we thought ayahuasca would be uh, potentially be a good treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. And that kind of started a, a chain reaction of, of just kind of getting more integrated and involved in the psychedelic community and into the, um, the conference circuit in talking about various um, approaches to doing psychedelic research. And so this was kind of the first of it. And then from that, we then, um, I think I was invited, I used to spend a lot of time at the California Institute for Integral Studies. There was a lot of cool lectures that were happening and obviously are still happening. Um, and the head of uh, the Entheogenic Research Integration and Education Group, it was, I think it was just Larry Norris at the time, <clears throat> it's its grown, but they were having kind of this first ever women's entheogenic symposium. And he had asked me and Julie to speak at that. And it was sort of as like a prequel to the, um, the psychedelic science conference that happened in 2013. Um, and so in preparation for that, um, they had asked the speakers for psychedelic science in 2013 to kind of give this personal narrative of like psychedelic science and me. 
which I was a little nervous to do at the time um, because I was actually also trying to get a job at the VA or extend my appointment to also include the, the Department of Veteran Affairs and kind of worried that, you know, during the whole FDA background check, if they found this video about me talking about my personal experience that I wasn't going to get the job or something. But I did it anyway and just kind of gave a brief little background about how psychedelics had inspired me um, to, to work with trauma and kind of helped inspire some of the ideas I have about how to do my scientific research and, and some insights that I've had about working with trauma. Um, and so that's sort of just out in the public domain. Um, and then that was followed up by actually being able to give this talk at Psychedelic Science in 2013. It was um, pretty exciting, also very nerve wracking. Um, it was quite a large audience and just being able to meet all these people that I'd been reading about and kind of idolizing for so long. Um, and so that, that was kind of an interesting experience of both myself and Julie Megler, we kind of co-presented this, this talk, kind of talking about what we had written in our position piece about why we hypothesized that um, ayahuasca would potentially be a good therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, we had, um, from that, there was this plant medicine track that Bia Labate, who's a, an, a prominent anthropologist in the field, um, she basically wanted everyone from that plant medicine track to contribute to this book that came out later in 2014 called The Therapeutic Use of Ayahuasca. And so this was kind of my first official kind of academic work product, um, aside from that talk that uh, Julie Megler and myself co-authored and kind of didn't really have much data to work with other than it was almost just like a review, but I was able to get the consent from uh, a couple of the people that I had um, taken ayahuasca with down in Peru, these war veterans, and they had shared their trip reports with me and kind of one of the main things that popped up in them describing what their experience was like was the, the fact that they kept referring it to medicine as medicine uh, for their post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and then also just sort of looking at other, you know, data that's out there about what an ayahuasca experience is like. And so this was mine from Arrowhead and also published in that book chapter. Um, and just kind of another one of those striking things was that even though a lot of people described having difficult experiences, they also found them to be glowing and mystical. Um, so that seemed encouraging that this was like a good avenue to explore. And just having done all that, I got kind of bombarded by media requests to do all these different interviews and whatnot for something I hadn't even done yet. You know, it was just, it felt like it was a lot of talking about the research without starting the research. It was kind of an interesting space to be in. Um, but that was kind of another piece of advice was just like, put yourself out there, get your name out there, start talking about it, and hopefully the opportunities will come. Um, so, so I was happy to do all these interviews and, and kind of get my name out there. Um, but, you know, as this idea of ayahuasca for PTSD started to gain traction and it started to become really hyped up, um, there was a lot of uh, reports of harm and um, kind of, you know, instances of people dying or people being abused or assaulted, um, just a lot of questionable things happening you know, ayahuasca tourism becoming a, a prominent thing where there just seemed to be a lot of exploitation and harm around people thinking that ayahuasca was this magic bullet cure for trauma or depression and flocking down there and paying lots of money and perhaps sitting in ceremony with people that might not be so trustworthy. And so that was really kind of starting to disturb me a little bit um, and worried that I was kind of playing a role in, in hyping this up without formally understanding whether it was appropriate for PTSD. And so in sort of, you know, reading the literature and looking at what some of the other people in the psychedelic research space were doing, you know, a lot of folks, especially at Hopkins, were doing these anonymous online surveys, which seems to be a really quick and easy way to get some good data, um, where you hopefully can <clears throat> get a lot of people to engage with your study. Um, and hopefully they'd be more forthcoming and open because it's anonymous. And so hopefully you get more people sharing their experiences and we could kind of get a sense of whether there actually is some enough anecdotal evidence about this, about ayahuasca specifically for PTSD. And also trying to figure out if there's any substantial harms that were being reported uh, that should be um, paid attention to. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of the, of the results just cause this is more about kind of the journey and kind of the logistics of becoming a psychedelic researcher. Um, but you know, the study, the survey was, it's interesting and it has its limitations, you know, it's anonymous, it's online, um, it's retrospective and cross-sectional. Um, there was variabilities in set and settings of participants. Um, and just in retrospect, I think it would have been 
a little bit better to not limit it to English speaking participants. And because basically we couldn't, we didn't have like a Spanish version or a Portuguese version, which might've been a little bit more culturally appropriate. Um, but again, like even still, I was, you know, I was kind of conducting this survey and, and kind of sharing my results with folks. And, um, and actually just to, to point out, Ali was actually instrumental in kind of collaborating on that ayahuasca survey. So I would have regular calls with her and Rick Doblin and Bia Labate um, and Julie Megler about um, the development of the survey and what kind of questions to ask. And so as the data was coming in, I was continuing to kind of put the information out there. And um, I think I submitted a request to be part of this nerd night, which is this really fun group in San Francisco where people get together in a bar and drink beers and, and give talks. And so the idea is to kind of have it be a little bit informal and fun. And so they, they ask that you have like two beers before you get on stage just so you can be a little loose and funny. So that was kind of interesting. And then from that, I actually got a lot of, like people saw it and I actually got more requests to give more talks. Um, not necessarily this one, but so this was a, a conference, an invitation that I got from Bia Labate and some other folks um, to speak at Horizons in 2016 about the preliminary results of the survey. And then spoke again um, on those results at Psychedelic Science in 2017, um, which was a really great opportunity to go back and um, kind of hang out with folks again. And I was able to attend this uh, researchers workshop that they had where I got to be in the, this closed room with kind of all the people at the forefront of, of doing psychedelic research, which was really exciting, really exciting and inspiring to, to get to talk to all these people and network with these folks and learn from them. Another thing that happened, um, so while I was in San Francisco and after that conference, um, Don Latin actually hit me up. He's a, he's a prominent author in the Bay Area. He wrote this book called um, The Harvard Psychedelic Club about um, what was going on in the 60s with Tim Leary and Ram Dass and kind of like the behind the scenes of what happened with them basically getting fired. Um, and then he was in the process of writing this book, Changing Our Minds, and he wanted to interview me about my experience down in Peru at this uh, retreat center that I had gone to. And it was more about like my experience taking ayahuasca and working at the center or working with the shaman at the center rather than like my psychedelic research. And it's a really good book. And I think it's really underappreciated because then unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but then like the next year, this book came out, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. And I always thought it was kind of weird that uh, Don Latin's book didn't get enough attention. And then this book by Michael Pollan comes out that has kind of the same name and title and just thought that was kind of bizarre. Um, so I just want to give credit to Don Latin, I think for really, really uh, kind of having the original inspiration for the, the title of that book. Um, so in 2017, so, so all that is to say that, you know, I was actually trying to do a prospective ayahuasca study um, in collaboration with MAPS. And, you know, like I said, we were having regular meetings with Ali and Rick and Bia um, and trying to figure out how do we do a study with ayahuasca in the United States? Where do we even get a source of ayahuasca? And how do we work with the botanical division of the FDA to get some sort of um, product through the pipeline so that we could actually do this kind of work. And it was really challenging. Um, you know, we talked to so many different potential sources of, of finding some kind of standardized version of ayahuasca, trying to think of like using the freeze dried versions that they use in Spain, um, getting the stuff imported from the Santo Daime churches in Brazil, working with Santo Daime churches in the US. And it, I feel like it was like a year or two of just constantly talking about it, not really making any progress. And also working at UCSF at the time. So when I was there, it was kind of before or just right, yeah, right before the MDMA PTSD study was getting started as, as one of the sites at UCSF. Um, and so, and I also wasn't in the psychiatry department. I was in a neurosurgery department and our department chair would not let me do something like this. So I kept trying to find collaborators in psychiatry. Um, but ultimately, I ended up getting recruited to the University of Minnesota in 2017 to a psychiatry department, which, you know, was pretty strategic um, in that I, I wanted to make connections with psychiatrists, because if I was going to do psychedelic research, it needed to be in the appropriate department that would allow that. Because if you're going to do any kind of this research at a university, your department chair needs to sign off, the dean needs to sign off. So you really need to find an appropriate environment and home uh, to be able to do that kind of work. So. I came to the University of Minnesota in uh, 2017, in the fall of 2017, and um, started to figure out how could I actually make this a reality. So one of the first steps was to set up a community 
uh, for psychedelics to make sure I had enough research participants for any potential research I wanted to do. So um, coming from San Francisco, I was part of a psychedelic society. And so I started another chapter um, in Minneapolis and um, also kind of uh, through that community, somebody was interested in giving me money. I think somebody said, hey, I wanna give you $20,000. And I just kind of thought, wow, what do I do with this? So I contacted somebody at the university and they set up this special fund, uh, this psychedelic assisted therapy fund, which I'm kind of like the, um, the steward of, I guess. So like if other people wanted to do psychedelic research at the university, you know, I would be the one that would like review any proposals that came in. but. Right now I'm kind of the only person doing this, so it's kind of my fund, but it really should be for the whole university if other people decide they wanna do this. Um, and then I kind of just kept continuing uh, giving talks. I, I gave a talk in Prague in 2018 at the Beyond Psychedelics Conference. So this was again, more results from the ayahuasca survey. This time I was more interested in looking at um, qualitative assessments of risk and benefits. So really doing like grounded theory types analyses and looking at people's trip reports and trying to identify risks um, associated uh, with ayahuasca, especially for people that have PTSD. Um, and that's actually coming out in a book chapter uh, later next year. Um, I also gave a talk at the inaugural um, sleeping octopus assembly on psychedelics, which is held in Pittsburgh. Um, I think they've had two. I obviously they haven't had one in 2020. Um, so that was an interesting experience. And I got to hang out in person again with Bia and Rick after all of our planning, trying to get an ayahuasca study started. And in the meantime, actually, while I was at this conference, I got wind that my, um, I had applied for this grant from the University of Minnesota. It was an intramural grant where I had proposed to do a study looking at uh, psilocybin for alcohol use disorder. Um, and I had paired up with a couple of clinicians and it was just like a little small pilot grant where we were gonna um, look at this in about five people. And I was really excited to get this. And so I actually kind of made an announcement when I was speaking at SOAP uh, that I had gotten this award. Uh, but then just my department chair was actually really not happy that I, that I applied for this award and wanting to do this. And um, she kind of reprimanded me a little bit. And even though we had talked about doing psychedelic research, I think she kind of thought I was just going to do survey research and not trying to do any actual like in-person prospective psychedelic research. And through those conversations, uh, one of the other clinicians on the study decided he thought it was a little too controversial for him. And so he actually backed out of the study and I ended up losing the grant. Uh, so they decided to take the grant away from me and I wasn't able to actually do the study, which was really disheartening. So I kind of had to sit and think about like, okay, well, how do I move on from this? What else can I do in this space? And I was talking to some colleagues that were um, in my department that were working with schizophrenia and visual perception and visual hallucinations. And, you know, they were just kind of talking like, man, I wish there was like some positive control for visual distortions, you know, to have as like a comparator group. And I was like, well, you know, you can give people psilocybin and then that'll happen. And so I've been um, collaborating with this visual neuroscientist in my department. And, um, and so we actually started this new study now that we've received both um, FDA and IRB approval, and it's up on clinicaltrials.gov to look at uh, psilocybin in a visual surround suppression and perceptual expectation task. Um, so I've got everything set up and ready to go. Um, I just got my Schedule One DEA license, and that was quite the journey. Um, and so I'd say from the time I initially tried to start doing psilocybin research at the University of Minnesota until now, it's been about two years of just going through all of the, the regulatory hurdles. Um, it's really not trivial to try to do this kind of work. Um, fortunately, the university has a large um, grant from the National Institute of Health. It's one of these CTSA awards that provides a lot of administrative support for clinical research. So um, about summer of 2019, I kind of initially submitted my idea for this, this type of project and they met with me every week to develop the protocol, get everything ready to submit to FDA, make sure it was all perfect to submit to the IRB and helping me get all the regulatory paperwork in place to get the DEA license. And so, you know, about a year and a half later, we're now ready to go. Um, but unfortunately, you know, with COVID now coming uh, into play. And so I got IRB approval over the summer um, and so we've just been trying to think about how do we actually implement psychedelic research in person with COVID on board? 
And, you know, our university doesn't necessarily have really um, quick turnaround testing for COVID. So we're just trying to figure out what does that look like? Do we require people to quarantine for two weeks or, you know, mandate testing? Or do we just kind of all sit in the room with our full PPE and try to, you know, facilitate dosing sessions uh, with people wearing masks and face shields and physical barriers? And so um, that's kind of the plan right now is to you know, start slow, enroll the first participant and have the PPE on. We're enrolling people that are healthy. They don't have any uh, major mental illness in their history. They're physically healthy and uh, people that have experience taking magic mushrooms or psilocybin so that they will be comfortable. Um, but, you know, it is gonna be a bit challenging to kind of don all this PPE, sit in the basement of a hospital <laughs> Um, for eight hours with kind of all this on board. So it'll be an interesting journey to see what uh, comes out of that and you know what kind of modifications we might need to take into consideration. Um, I've been very slow to get started just because I wanna make sure we have all the safety precautions in place and we don't become a study that's gonna be like a super spreader. Um, but you know, the university is allowing us to move forward with it. Uh, we have this thing called a sunrise plan, which basically is making sure you're accounting for safety for your staff and for study participants related to COVID. And um, I know I've talked to some of the folks that, you know, just in, in consulting, like what are some of the other sites doing? Like the folks at Hopkins are proceeding and they have kind of a rapid test where I think they can get the results in 24 hours. The, the folks at um, NYU have a system where they can get tested within three hours. I think they had a lot more cases in New York. So they really had to ramp up their ability to test. Um, here in Minnesota, we don't necessarily have that. So I think our best turnaround time is 48 to 72 hours. And so most of the, like if you're going into the clinic to do any kind of procedure, like a surgery, the, the protocol is to just get a test 72 hours before you come in. I'm not sure how, how useful that's gonna be, um, but hopefully with the PPE and having like a, an air filter in the room and really trying to keep our distance as much as possible, uh, we'll be able to do this, but um, yeah, so it'd be interesting to kind of hear some people's thoughts about that. Um, just to wrap up, I'm not, yeah, so like I said, um, some of the ayahuasca um, qualitative research that I was talking about is coming out next year in this new book called Ayahuasca Healing and Science that's co-edited by um, Bia Labate and Clancy Kavnar. Um, and there's just some additional stuff. I'm continuing to work with this data, um, really kind of becoming more interested in looking at trip reports and the differences between mystical experiences between ayahuasca and DMT um, and some other things that I won't go into um, right now. And I've just been, you know, trying to stay involved in the community, um, making sure like as a psychedelic researcher, I'm also really well integrated in the psychedelic community. Um, which has been kind of an interesting journey. We actually just got approved uh, for this community organization. We actually just got our 501c3 status. So we're an official nonprofit now, which is good. Um, but, you know, lately things have been a little uh, intense in the psychedelic research space and the community space around um, anti-racism and inclusion. And so, um, I'm just trying to figure out how to navigate all that and wondering, you know, what is and isn't appropriate as a, as a white researcher to be doing psychedelic research on plant medicines. Um, one of the things that occurred to me when I was having trouble getting ayahuasca research moving forward was, you know, really heeding the advice of, of people that would say, you know, ayahuasca can be really challenging and maybe not always challenging experientially, but just working with ayahuasca and sometimes she'll show up in different ways that, you know, will kind of give you a hint of like, maybe this isn't appropriate or maybe this is, some, this is something you shouldn't do. And I felt like all the barriers to trying to get an ayahuasca study started in the United States by trying to find some pharmaceutical grade ayahuasca and then just finding all these challenges that maybe that was a clear sign from, from the ayahuasca spirit that maybe this, you know, you should think about this a little bit more in terms of just cultural appropriation and whether this is even something that I should be doing. So. So I've just been kind of like heeding that kind of wisdom um, in the various forms that it's been coming in and how to engage with this research um, that isn't just trying to westernize it and medicalize it and reduce it down to a pill. Um, and also just to touch on this article that came out earlier this year, 
um, from Jamila George, Timothy Michaels, Jay Savellis, and Monica Williams about, you know, white dominant medical frameworks within the psychedelic renaissance and some of the limitations in, you know, a lot of the, the psychedelic research studies have predominantly white participants and white facilitators and therapists. And so, you know, if, in working with plant medicines, we really should be um, consulting with and bringing in and collaborating with, you know, indigenous therapists, therapists of color, and making sure that we're um, understanding what their experience is like and making our teams more inclusive. You know, like if, if the entire team's white, you're not going to really be able to recruit non-white participants. Um, so, but I mean, that being said, when I, I, I get emails at least once a week from, you know, people that want to join my team or, you know, do graduate work in my lab, and it's, it's usually white men. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, just trying to figure out how to navigate that where I do need help, but I also don't want to just create an all white lab. Um, and so really just trying to sit with that and learn from that and doing a lot of anti-racist workshops and reading a lot of these kinds of articles that are coming out and trying to pay attention and learn how to do this work better. Um, and if that in includes, you know, doing some studies where I step down as the PI and I'm not the PI and I'm not the one running it. And um, yeah, so that's kind of been an interesting process and just, just been a really challenging long um, process of trying to get this work up and running. Um, and, you know, I would say it's been 13 years since I saw that first talk at MAPS, realizing this is something I could do professionally. And then 10 years since I really kind of set my, set my um, goal of, of being a psychedelic researcher in a professional way. Uh, to finally being at the cusp of being able to enroll my first participant in a, in a psilocybin study, so at a university. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Uh, thank you all so much for your attention, and I'll um, take any questions that you have. Hey, thanks so much, Jessica. This was really fascinating to hear the full trajectory of, of your journey, and so much has changed in these years in the psychedelic space in general. And a lot of times um, there's a lot of people that would like to be able to do research or um, uh, to, to professionally be able to uh, engage with these type of studies. And it's, uh, it's really great to hear, you know, about the challenges and the years of work that go into it. And I know that even just getting the IRB and the DEA approvals and the FDA approvals are usually under underestimated the amount of time that happens. Uh, so it takes years to, to really do that well and to get the approvals. And um, so thank you for that. And thank you for all the work too in the community and like giving space for the topics that um, you're reflecting on, especially how can you as a white woman and in your position be inclusive and um, be a beacon for uh, people of color and BIPOC communities to be included in this movement. So thanks for um, sharing those reflections. And uh, we do have time for questions. So if anybody in the group, we're a small group today. So I think if you have a question, why don't you just unmute yourself and uh, you can ask uh, Jessica yourself. I'll ask, um, I'm applying for PhD programs and a lot of these schools are, they're not naive to the research that's happening, but maybe a little hesitant. Um, how, like, what are recommendations that you would give for people in my position that are hopeful to do this kind of work? And knowing that in order to maybe encourage more departments to do it, it needs to go through that Western lens, but also like insisting that we continue to honor the indigenous parts of these medicines. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um... I would say like if you're interested in a specific program, seeing if there's any faculty that would potentially be your mentor and where they stand on that. Because ultimately, like as, as, a, as a graduate student, you could have this interest, but you need there needs to be a thesis advisor that's willing to sign off on your project. And um, so, you know, I think being able to determine if that's even something somebody's willing to do, because um, a lot of I think there's there's a lot of stigma around it of just even talking about it. I think that's changing a lot. Like when I first got to the University of Minnesota, like people really just, they wanted to talk about it behind closed doors. They didn't want to like discuss it in faculty meetings. And that's changed a lot in the last, you know, two or three years. 
So you might find a little bit more open-mindedness, um, but it would just help just to see, cause you're just gonna need a champion advisor that's really gonna help push this forward and being able to put their neck out for you and, and put their own neck out for themselves uh, to their department chair and the Dean of the University of whether they would be willing to do this kind of work. I appreciate it. I wasn't shy about it, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also like what I've been saying is, you know, ultimately this is really innovative work and it could be transformational and we're behind the curve if we're not doing it as a psychiatry department, you know, like this is where the field's going, so. Where are you thinking of applying? Um, I've applied to several places. I'm applying to clinical psych programs, um, but I have applied to UAB where Peter Hendricks does uh, psilocybin work. And then the other one that stands out is the University of Colorado in Denver. Mm -hmm. And they have a gentleman who's doing work with both MDMA and psilocybin. Yeah. They're out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's definitely more and more people coming online with this. So I think it's encouraging and hopeful. I actually have a quick question. Um, yeah. So I'm a master's level clinician currently practicing in Oregon, and Oregon just passed the measure 109 uh, that allows now the discussion for regulatory agencies to determine over the next two years who uh, the qualifications of uh, staff who would be able to administer assisted therapies from your standpoint and all the regulatory agencies that you've gone through, do you see uh, a specialty or who should really be on the forefront of those discussions for the next two years? Um, as an example, for those that are doctors or going for their doctorates, how is it kind of looking and seeing, well, what should the role of a counselor be in kind of that process, if at all? That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, in terms of like clinical training, just full disclosure, I'm not a clinician myself. I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist, but, you know, it seems like even just having some kind of license is kind of going to be the baseline of, you know, whether you're going to be allowed to do this kind of work and have that as part of your practice. And then making sure that there's some sort of standards in place for how to train clinicians to do this. I think right now there's all these different programs that, you know, there's not really a formal system right now of like you go to do a residency at a, at a psychiatry department and they have a psychedelic assisted therapy residency that you can do. Like, I think that will hopefully start to come online in the next couple of years that hopefully there'll be that framework in place that then will be like a and like, you know, you go to learn EMDR or some other thing, and then you, you add, you know, psychedelic assisted therapy to your toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people working on, I know that Allie and some other folks are really working on trying to create these kind of educational frameworks so that clinicians can do this. Um, but like what that would look like in terms of, you know, licenses to practice psychedelic assisted therapy. I think, you know, right now the only formal system that seems to be in place is the MAPS protocol. So if you're working on one of their studies, they have, they have a whole formal training program. Uh, but I don't think that exists right now for psilocybin. Um, I think they, that NYU just got some funding to do a program to train therapists to do it. Um, but right now it's just kind of been these one-off that have most, mostly been in the context of research studies, not necessarily like for implementation in a clinic. Um, but I think that Oregon's, you know, recent successes there, I think we'll really open it up and change it and change the game in that front because it'll make it a little bit more accessible for clinicians to do that work and not feel so stigmatized about it. I think there's also yeah. the real risk, the fear of like, am I gonna lose my license if I try to engage with this work, so. Yeah, the FDA is really, you know, want to be as safe as possible right now. And so the two clinician model and, um, you know, at MAPS, they were at this time wanting a PhD and, or MD to be one person on that team. And, you know, MAPS is really trying to negotiate that point because, you know, they feel that, you know, a licensed therapist is just as qualified to hold that space as a PhD psychologist, or, you know, they didn't see that the training that they offered and the supervision they're able to assure that they feel that that level of training is sufficient for safety as well as the therapeutic benefits. But with Oregon's initiative, um, it's not all going to be based on this therapeutic model. So the type of trainings or qualifications someone may need to have is going to be developed through their criteria. And that'll be, um, could be great to see how it unfolds. I mean, for sure, maybe a, the second person in the model could 
be a peer support person in some cases. If someone wasn't struggling with really significant mental health conditions, it seems reasonable to think that a container would be safe and held with uh, other type of supportive roles. So, but yeah, and also with- just like therapy for, you know, maybe someone doesn't have, you know, a major mental illness, but they're just looking for as like a prophylactics to promote wellness or spiritual development. And, and does a clinician need to be involved in that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, a lo- I think a lot of misunderstanding what ha- happened with Oregon, that it's not just like a clinic model for mental health conditions and you need to have a diagnosis to receive psilocybin. It's really going to be open to anyone that's in Oregon, resident of Oregon is my understanding. Um, but for sure the FDA is, Go to put out guidelines. I have a It'll question. I'm, I'm sorry, I look orange. Uh, I, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I, had, I had a little technical difficulty. It cut me out. Now I'm I'm on, but I'm orange. So I thought that that uh, anyway. My my question is is about maps. I I uh, I um am a graduate of the uh, California Institute of Integral Studies CPTR program, and that included some of the maps training. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if you knew um, uh, when the, the remainder of the MAPS training would, uh, would be available. Yeah, so what I've heard is that they are um, spending some time to really slow down and build their program out so that they'll have um, their competencies really placed out and their, their video content created so that they'll be able to train other teachers to be able to offer these trainings. And I think they're also really interested in partnering with other established programs like they, like Naropa and the CIS CTPR program. And, um, you know, so they've kind of hit this bottleneck of within MAPS organizations itself of how many people they could train and supervise. So now they're slowing down to really um, think how they could scale this out and have more supervisors and trainers. And so a lot of the people that have initially gone through these programs, it's interesting because they're, they may not have had the experience of actually working with anyone yet. So, um, you know, that bottleneck is related to the experience within the research trials for the trainers. Um, but to answer your question, I directly, I, I've heard that they were spending the spring to kind of revamp their program and then they will be, um, I guess, announcing how they're going to be unrolling their their next phase of, of the training program. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, but it comes down to the um, FDA, you know, for the risk, um, the REMS, it's called the Risk Mitigation Evaluation Strategy. So for things like S-ketamine examples, they said in that document, you know, it has to be delivered in a clinic. It has to be supervised by a person. And within the rooms, they can also specify what type of trainings or um, qualifications would be needed to maintain a, maintain safety. But at this point, no one really knows. And with the flourishing of psychedelic research, I think other companies are proposing different levels of qualifications or um, experience that people should should have to to be guiding these sessions. Yeah, I think to that point, one kind of controversial topic is whether the therapist needs to have that firsthand experience. I know they do that with the MDMA training, right? But then they give them the option to do something else if they don't want to take MDMA. But then some people just thinking like, you don't need the, the direct firsthand experience and others that think you do. Yeah. And what does that look like for training? Yeah. I just saw in Canada, they approved... Um, a psilocybin experience for people as part of their training. Nice. Yeah. That was Canada's really ahead of the curve right now, especially with all their uh, compassionate use approvals going through recently. Mm-hmm. They have legal cannabis federally. <laughs> Does anybody from the group have another question? Well, I have another one. Okay. <laughs> this could maybe be a topic of discussion to you is, you know, we talk about um, 
you know, doing research in our in our Western model um, with our controls and our rigor, and this idea of how can we, um, you know, honor the traditions, but also give back to these communities of indigenous people that have held these medicines and traditions for so long. And so what does that really look like as researchers or um, or even companies, these pharmaceutical companies are gonna be developing these drugs. So I'm just curious if um, people have ideas about that. Yeah, we were talking about this the other day, actually. I was attending a anti-racist workshop with the Sabina Project, they're based out of Maryland. And um, you were talking about like sacred reciprocity, you know, and everything you take, you give back twofold. And so, I mean, that's kind of been another issue, I think, is the commercialization of psychedelic therapies and kind of seeing all these this stuff pop up. And if there is going to be a lot of money to be made, I think a lot of that should be given back to some of these communities that they're built from, at the very there least. Is, yeah, there is one company, it's called Journey, and they, uh, they're going to be working with mescaline, a synthetic form, but their model is that they want to give back a certain amount of whatever profit they make directly to uh, indigenous cultures or communities. And I'm not sure that they um, have put out their full plan for that, but that was the first one I'd heard of that that was built into their business model. And that was how they uh, saw their place in um, you know, bringing these medicines to help heal uh, alcohol use disorders is the study they're gonna be looking at, but also from the Western money that they may be able to make, giving that back. And that also is a, a question too, you know, how do you do that? Like just dumping a bunch of US dollars in an indigenous community can also cause harm if it not um, placed, you know, with care and consideration about how that will affect the community. So that, that's one, one way people are looking at. I feel like from my standpoint, I've kind of considered, cause you know, I'd like to work with with veterans and I have considered just even like narrowing my focus into like maybe like indigenous veterans or female veterans or by POC veterans I mean I'm married to a white male veteran and like no offense like he has tons of resources so maybe even just narrowing my work in that way could be helpful because you know there's less funding for that. There's less people interested in that. And we already have this problem with a ton of white research participants. So why not do that? And then like Jessica said, bringing people on board to, you know, you're not always the PI or you're listening to others in those communities about what they need. Looks like Maria had her hand up. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm one of those that is caught in the middle of two worlds. So I'm um, originally from South America and I have opportunity to work at times in Canada. I'm permanently based in Panama. So I kind of, I, I have, I would say the benefit of seeing things from more than a single perspective. And one of the things like from the academic point of view that at times I also face a limitation with is, um, to me, a good way of giving back is giving um, placements for research for South American students that would like to learn research methodology or like kind of introduce them to the language because how we speak about these things in South America sounds very different from all the terminology that we use. And I guess I consider myself fortunately, fortunate that I can not only access the literature in English, but I also the terminology, but we talk in very different ways uh, when we talk about ayahuasca or other medicinal plants. So something that we lack is the learning opportunities. And, and I get it, there are so many practical impediments, right? Visas, uh, licenses to practice. But I think that's you know a project that gives back through education so that we can own our own language or even develop our own language and our, and our research methodology, or I think that would be very, very well received. Um, partnerships with universities in South America. I'm looking, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist and 
I'm looking at the curriculum of psychology in, in the university, in public university in Buenos Aires, in, in Rosario, where I trained, and there is no room or not even a notion of what's going on in other parts of the globe. So creating programs for having a psychedelic 201 or things, things like we can you know, access through, through different course providers in the North, right? We either cannot even afford it because they are in US dollars or you know, to have it embedded in the public education system, those are amazing ways of uh, giving back. So that's one, one comment that I had. But I also had a question for you, Jessica. I was, I was curious to hear your ideas in relations to what, what do you think are the main limitations that um, traditional research methodology has in, in terms of capturing what, what's happening in what's happening in, in that expanded state of consciousness, consciousness, whether it's ayahuasca or or, or, or psilocybin. Where, where do you think we run short of? Um, tools or or methods um, from from the traditional Western um, research approach. That's a really great question. Um, you know, obviously, the scientific method you know likes to have very rigorous design and controls, making sure you have that placebo group to compare with the drug group. But it's really hard to have a placebo for a psychedelic experience because it's so intense at some point. Like if you're trying to blind to that. It's, it's really just for show, I think, you know, just for design purposes, because there's no way to truly blind it unless you're comparing it to another drug. Like, like if you had high dose cannabis and then a psychedelic, you know, then those are your two groups, because then the participant might not really know what's going on and maybe the facilitators won't either. Um, I think the other issue is also just trying to reduce everything down to numbers you know, trying to have questionnaires to try to describe this experience. Like there's this mystical experience as questionnaire that's trying to categorize this expansive experience that is really more qualitative and subjective. Um, and it's boiled down to like this 30 item questionnaire. And one of those is ineffability, which you can't describe it. And yet people try their best to describe it, um, okay. you know, and then trying to link that to, okay, let's do some neuroimaging research and see if that tracks with it. And I've been doing a lot. I've, I'm actually in a master's program right now and I'm learning about qualitative research and theory and finding that that's probably a lot more appropriate. It takes a lot more work, but really getting into like narratives and subjective experiences. And it doesn't always need to be quantitative. I think making everything quantitative is where you just lose a lot of the value and a lot of the meaning. But, you know, we, we just, Western medicine and Western science wants to standardize everything and generalize everything. And we're all so different. You can't, I don't know that you can generalize all of this. You know, that's why I like uh, one of the other things that I work on is precision medicine. And it's like trying to figure out this is one person, they have a whole history and experience and, and a unique perspective and, and a unique genetics, you know, all that needs to be taken into consideration and you deal with that one person. And it's probably going to look totally different for somebody else. And so, but that doesn't fit nicely into the FDA's pipeline of how to approve something or how to like, so yeah, I think like social sociology and anthropology, I think those are kind of better fields that can capture this, but psychiatry wants a piece of it. So <laughs> <laughs> I like your choice of words. Yeah. wants a piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also thought sociology and anthropology are richer paradigms to capture. Right, and, and also they have um, less pressure um, in, in terms of being in the production line, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but I also have to say they are disadvantaged at the time of applying for funding, right? And um, I, I think like we mentioned before, I'm, I'm sometimes very disheartened by these, um, you know, requirements of, of having PhDs, you know, unless a PhD is present in the room or a psychiatrist is present in the room, you know, things like kind of don't get seriously off the ground. Um, and I'm just thinking about how much that inflates the cost and what is that going to mean in terms of accessibility for people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I just sometimes get disheartened at seeing how we are replicating the very models that we wanted to part from. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, <laughs> I just have to sit with it <laughs> until I get a better idea, a better idea of how to counteract it. 
you know, science can be very reductionistic. The scientific model and psychedelics are everything but that. You know, it's about the mystery, about not no way of testing it, no way of qualifying it really. So these different disciplines really come in and religious studies and spirituality and, and how those interplay uh, with these other domains is really ripe for research on a lot of different fronts. And I hope the money starts coming from the normal agencies that fund this type of work and more individuals do and crowdfunding has, has, um, has gotten somewhere, but um, still so, so much, so many more people that wanna do this research could use the funds. Yeah. I mean, even just like maybe NSF funding would be more appropriate because I think that they're, they're a little bit more open. It doesn't have to be this rigid like clinical trial model. You know, it's more about discovery. Yeah. What is NSF? Sorry, it's, I don't know what that means. It's the National Science Foundation. So there's sort of two major federal funders for doing scientific research. One is the National Institute of Health and there's like 20 institutes, depending on what kind of disorder you're focused on, but that's more about like developing therapies and understanding diseases. And then there's the National Science Foundation where you can do research on a whole host of things that don't necessarily need to be health related. Okay, all right. I didn't know that. Thank you for the clarification. So would that include like certain aspects of social justice or things like these? Actually, yeah. Well, then there's a whole, um, there's the, I can't remember what the acronym, but it's a, it's an institute at the NIH that's about like health disparities. Um, so I think there could be social justice research um, factored into that, especially when it comes to health inequities. Yeah, and Maria, I really liked your suggestion about, you know, how programs in the West could provide internships or um, more graduate programs or postdocs or whatever it may be, or in or less formal trainings to other um, people in the South or other communities as a way of inclusivity into this. That's a really practical um, point you made there that could be incorporated. Yeah, I like that you brought that up because I also, I, I just got um, asked to, somebody wanted to join my lab from Brazil. Mm -hmm. And, and I just, you know, had to admit to myself, like, do I even have the funding for this? Like that's, you know, paying for a visa and the education and everything. And do I even have the money to train a student under that? Like if there was more financial resources for things like that, like inter, um, international partnerships for creating those. Cause I think that's kind of one of the significant barriers as a, as a mentor and a principal investigator is, you know, how do I pay for it? Yeah. I might want to do it, but I don't have the resources for it. There's, there's plenty of good stuff going on. I am myself the recipient of a lot of generosity and sliding scales and, and you, you know, there's certainly a lot of um, um, ways in, but nothing that would lead to um, a full research completion, right? So there's, there's opportunity in terms of joining conferences or short courses like uh, Fluence or um, I recently also received um, a scholarship from the synthesis um, conference, and um, you know, it's it's there's there's a lot of consciousness in terms of involving people, but nothing that would amount to a to a full learning program, right? So nothing that would allow me, for example, to go back home and say look, I trained here and here and here, and I'd like to open up a department of psychedelic studies in the University of Buenos Aires or in the University of Rosario. So no, nothing of that substance that then perpetuates, uh, you know, more, more um, opening of, of institutes in South America. So we have, access, like I said, access to the knowledge, but without really the, the, the substance of what is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, we're getting um, to the end of our time here. And I just had a question before we wrap up. Um, typically, we just uh, share the speaker portion with the um, rest of the network. And I was just wondering how people felt about us sharing the Q&A portion in our discussion piece. Um, so if, because your video would be on it or your name. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, just you can just chat me right now. Um, just put something in the chat and I'll see it. Um, and if no one chats anything, I'll just assume that you're okay with us posting the QA uh, portion today. Yep. 
Yeah, and I just want to close by uh, wishing you the best, Jessica, in your path. And that's really, really trailblazing the work there at the University of Minnesota and being a female researcher uh, is a huge feat and a lot of people drop out of the programs over time. So I really applaud your <laughs> tenacity to continue on even in the face of all these challenges. And um, yeah, yeah. And I want to wish everybody a uh, happy holidays and safe. And I hope it's a really fulfilling and relaxing time for everyone. And we're going to pick back up in January with the Plant Medicine Law Group, uh, which we're excited to ask some questions to them or, around what clinicians might be uh, facing or thinking about as they step into the world of psychedelic integration or ketamine work or setting up clinics or whatever it may be. So thank you all for joining today. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much, Jessica.